Hello everyone and welcome to my first ever countdown video here on Travel Dash. Over the past 10 months, I've spent a lot of time documenting my experiences at national parks and other natural landmarks in the United States and around the world. We've covered a number of areas thoroughly, including my first series through California, as well as videos through the Las Vegas area, the East Coast, Iceland, Switzerland, and more. Back in May, when we did our big California road trip, my brother and I had the chance to visit eight of the nine national parks in the state. The only one we didn't get around to that trip was Channel Islands National Park, since that one requires a little trip of its own. If you've been keeping up with the channel lately, you'll know that we finally got around to visiting Channel Islands in January. So now, after visiting all nine California national parks, I've decided to rank them all from worst to best in this video. But there are some major caveats I want you to be aware of before we begin. The main one is that I'm only ranking these parks off of what we saw and what we experienced. That's why this list may look a little different than a more objective list of the national parks when you consider the opportunities for backpacking, stargazing, and wildlife sightings that we simply did not get the chance to experience. The biggest example of this was Lassen Volcanic National Park. We visited this park before the road circling the park was open from snowfall, meaning we could only see small portions of it. That's why it got a lower spot on this list, though I suspect it'll rank a lot higher once we've seen more of it. Also, you have to understand my preferences in a national park. I tend to prefer mountains and lush forest scenery above anything else, but I do also enjoy the desert parks very much. All right, let's waste no more time and dive into my rankings of every national park in the state of California. At number nine is Joshua Tree National Park. Joshua Tree is the closest national park to where I live, just a two and a half hour drive from San Diego. Therefore, I've had the chance to visit multiple times now in different times of year, but my thoughts have generally remained the same. I definitely enjoy Joshua Tree for what it is, and I think you could have a really fun day here, but it is far and away my least favorite national park in the state. From my knowledge, that's a bit of an unpopular take. I know many people who will rank this one towards the top. While I do try hard to respect a differing opinion, since I know people like different things, I think it's crazy to put this park over any of the top seven. I would understand if you wanted to move it up by one spot, but that's it. The scenery here is just on a smaller scale compared to some of the other national parks. Joshua Tree is located in the desert region of Southern California where the Mojave and Colorado deserts meet. The park protects the elusive Joshua Tree which only grows in elevations between 2,000 and 6,000 feet in California, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah. They are found nowhere else in the world. Therefore, I understand why this park was given national park designation, as I do think it's important that we preserve these plants. Something interesting about the Joshua tree is that they aren't really trees, they're more so cacti since they store water. That's why the name can be kind of deceiving. I'd also advise you to keep your eyes peeled for the Choya cacti, which is actually my favorite plant in the park. These cactus look like they're glowing with their vibrant appearance. The best place to find the Choya cacti is at the Choya Cactus Garden, which is a fun area of the park to explore. Another thing Joshua Tree is well known for is its large rock formations. It's one of the best parks out there if you're a rock climber or just enjoy rock scrambling. The Jumbo Rocks area is a great place to do this, but there's also some fun hikes incorporating the rock formations. These include the Hidden Valley Nature Trail and the Arch Rock Trail. Lastly, while it is a little bit of a detour, definitely check out Key's View. This is something I didn't get to experience on my first visit to the park, but it's actually a pretty nice view of the Desert Mountains and San Andreas Fault. Overall, while I'm not as high on Joshua Tree as some people, I don't deny that it's worth a visit, especially if you love observing small details in nature. Number eight, Pinnacles National Park. This is an underrated national park in my opinion. Before my visit, I had heard maybe a few people talk about this one, but that's it. You can find Pinnacles just outside of the Central Valley, not too far from Big Sur or the San Francisco Bay Area. Area. It's definitely a drier park and something I would personally consider to be a desert national park. That said, you may be surprised by the diversity of flora and fauna here. There were many points where I saw lush ferns, trees, and water activity. At one point, we even got to check out the Bear Gulch Reservoir, which was impressive to see in a park like this. Now, when talking about Pinnacles National Park, three big things come to mind. The first and most obvious is the namesake of the park, the Pinnacles. These large rock formations were formed by volcanic eruptions that occurred 23 million years ago near present-day Lancaster. In my opinion, these rock formations are much more impressive than those of Joshua Tree National Park. Here, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, forming cliffs and even caves. That leads me to the second thing the park is well known for, and that's its tailless caves. These are different from most caves because these are actually located above or at ground level and are formed by boulders that have piled up on mountain slopes. If anything, these types of caves can be pretty scary to navigate because it looks like any of these rocks could fall down and crush you. While the Bear Gulch Cave was closed during our visit, we did get to check out the Balconies Cave. While short, it was absolutely wonderful while it lasted, and the way they incorporated it into the old Pinnacles Trail was spectacular. The third 
third thing of note here is the wildlife. We saw lots of deer, lots of wild turkey, lots of lizards, and lots of dragonflies in the park. But by far the thing that stands out the most is the California condor. This is the largest North American land bird that can only be found in northern Arizona, southern Utah, northern Baja California, and the coastal mountains of California. The California condor became extinct in the wild in 1987, but have since been reintroduced with a population that is slowly increasing. We were lucky enough to see a few of them around sunset, and they are absolutely ginormous. They have a wingspan of about nine and a half feet and look eerily similar to a turkey vulture from afar. The main difference is of course the size, but also the location of white on the underside of their wings, and also condor don't flap their wings nearly as much as turkey vultures do. Anyways, Pinnacles National Park was a really enjoyable experience for me. It's not the most impressive park you'll ever visit, but one that certainly deserves more recognition in my opinion. Number 7, Lassen Volcanic National Park. As I said earlier, when we visited this park, almost all of the signature attractions and best things to see were not available due to snowfall. But it's clear to me that the scenery and geothermal activity is amazing in this area and that Lassen Volcanic National Park has the potential to shoot up into the top three with the visit in the summer or early autumn. If you only have the opportunity to visit in the off season, only do it if the detour isn't too significant. You'll only be able to spend half a day to three fourths of a day depending on what's open. When the scenic byway circling the park is closed, you'll have to do what we did and drive from the southern entrance to the northern entrance, which takes takes about an hour and a half each way. From the south, you're able to drive up to the visitor center and then walk enough of the scenic byway to get all the way to Lassen Peak Trailhead. But to hike Lassen Peak this time of year would have taken a dozen miles of walking along the road, not even including the five mile out and back hike in itself, which is already a sizable journey. So no thanks, I'll save that one for a repeat visit. What we were able to see by walking a mile or so up the road was Sulphur Works. This is a cool geothermal site with mud pots that are always bubbling. It was a really amazing site, but from my knowledge, it's just a small preview of Bump as Hell, which is the main geothermal area in the park. That's something where if it's open, you should absolutely check it out. Otherwise, we also did two hikes in the northern part of the park. The one I really enjoyed was the Manzanita Lake Loop, which gives you some of the best views possible of Lassen Peak, which is the southernmost major mountain in the Cascade Range. We also got to do the Chaos Crags Trail, which was four miles out and back. This was pretty and had some great views of the landscape and craggy mountainsides, but the lake that should have been there at the end was dried up. Clearly, we visited the park at a time where it hadn't fully come to life. Experiencing Lassen Peak, Bump as Hell, Devil's Kitchen, King Creek Falls and the Cinder Cone are all bucket list items that I hope to check off with a revisit at some point this year. Number six, Channel Islands National Park. California's least visited national park is the one that caught me most by surprise of them all. It protects five remarkable islands off the coast of Southern California, preserving a wealth of natural and cultural resource. Isolation over thousands of years have created unique animals and plants that are abundant with a single visit to one of these islands. The national park works with Island Packers, which is a company that offers excursions to the islands, and that's because the only way to visit this park is by boat. That makes for a super tranquil, unpopulated experience, which is amazing considering how close you are to Los Angeles. We were able to take two trips with Island Packers, first to the largest island, Santa Cruz, and then a winter whale watch tour that focuses around Anacapa Island. Many will call this national park the Galapagos of North America, and I can absolutely understand why. Everything from the sea life to the animals on land were incredible. We saw several dolphins and whales on the water, and a plethora of unique birds and island foxes on land. I've got to stop and really highlight the foxes since they are the most adorable things in the world and are an integral part of this national park. Each island fox subspecies that exists on the Channel Islands are endangered and have a similar story to the California condor. However, unlike the condor, the only place in the world you can find the island fox is in this one national park, meaning they are completely endemic. These beautiful creatures are the smallest canid species in the world, like I'd be willing to bet that your pet cat is bigger than these things. The island fox isn't found on all the islands, but they are on Santa Cruz Island, which is part of the reason I wanted to visit that one in particular. That, and it's also the largest one with the most things to do. We took a number of hiking trails here, all of which were really well done, and we must have saw less than five people on each. Potato Harbor is the most popular site on Santa Cruz Island, and it is a very nice overlook. But also check out Cavern Point. I think that one is equally as amazing. We also did some hiking in Scorpion Canyon, but due to the recent bomb cyclones, the off-trail route was flooded by water. Even so, I'd highly recommend visiting the Channel Islands after a significant amount of rainfall. They become much more lush and green than they normally are in the summer months. As I previously mentioned, we also did the Whale Watch Tour focused around Anacapa Island. This is a little cruise offered in the wintertime in an attempt to catch whales migrating from Alaska to the warm waters of Baja, California. Anacapa Island has a far different look than Santa Cruz as it seems a bit more rugged and maybe a little drier, but I really enjoyed seeing the steep cliffs and sea arch along with the elephant seals chilling along the water. Channel Islands is a park that I didn't have the highest expectations for since the footage I had seen previously made it out to be just okay. But since it's absolutely an experience-based park, depending on the wildlife sightings and time of year you visit, plan accordingly and I promise you'll have an incredible time here. I can't wait to return to this park and see some of the other islands in the future. Number five, Kings Canyon National Park. The first of three parks on this list located in the Sierra Nevada mountain range 
Range, Kings Canyon might be one of the most unique national parks of them all. Not just because of its dramatic landscape, which we'll get to in a second, but also because of the park boundaries and layout. Kings Canyon is jointly administered with Sequoia National Park as one unit, so while it is two separate parks, they are often grouped together and called Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. The similarities between the two parks are very evident, with massive sequoia trees and steep granite cliffs, but also some major differences as well. The majority of Kings Canyon's boundaries occupy the backcountry area that require long hikes to get to. The main road heading through the park makes a dead end at a turnaround called Road's End, where you can then park your vehicle and head on a backpacking trip. Therefore, if you want to speak with technicalities in mind, we barely saw any of this national park. I actually predict that if you go experience the backcountry hiking trails, then this could go as far as to rank in the top three on this list. But even without doing any of this, I enjoyed my day at Kings Canyon very much. The main route heading to Road's End is called the Kings Canyon Scenic Byway, and is the road you're going to want to take to get beneath some of these towering peaks. Along the way, there's a number of incredible pullouts where you get to see some of the mountain range and steep cliffs that look like a smaller version of Yosemite's granite formations. I'd recommend stopping at as many of these as you can, and once you get to the low point of the road before Road's End, there's a number of really awesome stops you can make that only require short hikes. First, there are several waterfalls we enjoyed, like Grizzly Falls and Roaring River Falls. Grizzly Falls is a nice picnic spot with tables right out front and is a roadside stop that takes very little time to see. Roaring River Falls does take a short hike to get to, but the waterfall is much more impressive than we expected. It doesn't look like much from the pictures and videos I captured, but it has a super cool shape with an amazing backdrop of a steep cliffside. My favorite short hike here was the Zumwalt Meadows Trail. This is a 1.5 mile loop with some impressive views of the mountains and cliffs, plus the lush meadow that usually offers a plethora of wildlife sightings. We were lucky enough to see some deer, as well as tons of colorful butterflies and even a snake. Both Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks have one cave tour respectively, and while we didn't get to do the one at Sequoia, we did do the Boyden Cave at Kings Canyon. We had a somewhat poor experience because of the guests disobeying rules and touching things they weren't supposed to touch, but looking at the formations themselves, it was a really unique cave that I'm glad we got the chance to see. Lastly, I mentioned how this park has Sequoia trees, and those can be seen best in the Grant Grove section of the park. This is home to General Grant, the second largest tree in the world behind General Sherman at Sequoia National Park next door. However, I actually preferred this grove by a long shot since there were so few people here making it easy to appreciate the immersive atmosphere and sheer size of these behemoths. It's crazy to say that what we did at Kings Canyon was only a small appetizer for what the rest of the park has to offer. I can't wait to come back here and do some of the backpacking hikes because I'd be willing to bet that they are absolutely amazing. Number four, Sequoia National Park. Surprise, surprise, with the amount of times I compared Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Parks, it's a given that they'd be ranked side by side. Now, originally I had Kings Canyon a spot higher since I found the scenery there to be a bit more impressive. But looking back at my time at Sequoia, I decided to give it the benefit of the doubt because the things we experienced here were better and the park feels a bit more diverse. Before we talk about what we got to do at this park, let me also mention that the backpacking here is likely also incredible. Fun fact, Sequoia National Park actually encompasses Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the lower 48 states. You can access that trail from the other side of the mountain range near Lone Pine in the Alabama hills, but that's not something we wanted to do on our first visit. However, I don't doubt that it's an amazing experience and that this park could go a spot or two higher after some backcountry hikes. While the boundaries of this national park does encompass a large expanse of backcountry, it also does feature a more traditional layout of a national park. It's got more of those must-see sites, more shorter hikes, and more trails as a whole in comparison to Kings Canyon. Upon arriving to Sequoia National Park, I was surprised by how dry it was at the lower elevations. I wouldn't call it a desert or anything, but the Lemon Hills threw me off a little bit. The General's Highway that takes you up to the higher elevations of the park, where all the trails and sites are, is so underrated. It's honestly reminiscent of the Kings Canyon Scenic Byway, only less impressive, but also talked about so much less. The more you gain elevation, the more lush the scenery becomes. It seemed like in a blink of an eye, we were suddenly in a lush forest. But this entire time, I was thinking to myself, where are the sequoia trees that the park is named after? Well, as soon as you get to the high point of the road, they'll start to pop up right away. This is a section of the park called the Giant Forest, and I knew when I said this, it wasn't based off of impulse. I think this might be my favorite forest I've ever seen. To be surrounded by the Earth's most monolithic trees is just jaw-dropping and an incredibly amazing sight. Some popular hikes in the park to see giant sequoias are the Congress Trail, home to the General Sherman tree, the largest tree on the planet. It's a wonderful sight that you should see once, but since there are a lot of people there, I'd recommend the Big Trees Trail as a quieter alternative. I feel like these forest-centric parks are best experienced with the little crowds and little noise, so this was a fantastic experience. There were lots of huge trees to see here and a beautiful meadow that you'll walk around. Ironically, the two highlights of this park had nothing to do with sequoia trees, and they are must-dos when you visit. First is Morrow Rock, which is a half-mile trail that requires lots of steps and can be a little intimidating due to the exposure you have. But for me, that 
made this an unbelievable experience, especially once you get to the top of the rock and get to outlook the Sierra Nevada mountains. We were up here for almost an hour taking in the views and it's something that I'd recommend to everyone, including beginner hikers. Also, one that far less people talk about that I absolutely loved was the Tokaba Falls Trail. This is a 3.8 mile out and back hike, but to be honest, it feels a little bit longer than that. Even so, the scenery is remarkable and keeps you engaged the entire time. We had a couple great wildlife encounters on this hike, including a marmot, which we had only seen a couple times out in the wild before. Tokaba Falls itself is an incredible payoff. The 1200 foot tall cascade is a phenomenal sight, and looking back into the mountains is just the cherry on top. I love Sequoia National Park. I think this is an amazing place. If you do visit, I would strongly advise you to prepare one full day for Sequoia and one full day for Kings Canyon, and potentially even longer if you'd like to do some backpacking trips. In my opinion, if you were to combine both of these parks into one big national park, it would have definitely been number two on this list. It's just an absolutely spectacular area with so many impressive sites and a must visit in the national park system. Number three, Redwood National Park. The northernmost national park in California, located just 15 miles from the Oregon border, is an absolute gem of a park. I think you could make an argument that this is the most remote of all the national parks in the state because to get here from our previous stop on the road trip, which was Mount Shasta, it took four and a half hours of windy roads in national forests, some paved and some unpaved. But to say that that was all worth it would be a massive understatement. Of all the national parks I've experienced so far, I think Redwoods is the most immersive one. We spent two days here and both days were met with moody fog rolling through the tree line and even a little bit of rain. Many people associate California as being completely dry, but to those people, I'd recommend you take a trip here. The Redwood area may as well be one of the rainiest and most lush parts of the entire country. Now, as the namesake suggests, Redwood National Park protects the redwood trees, which are in fact the tallest trees anywhere on the planet. The tallest one called Hyperion is very difficult to access and requires a long off-trail hike to get to, but it stands 380 feet tall. The next tallest ones can be found in the Tall Trees Grove section of the park. This section of the park is made up of a 3.6 mile loop trail that passes by some ginormous redwood trees. The most popular redwood hike, much to my surprise, was the Lady Bird Johnson Grove Trail. This is one I had never even heard of, but since it was the only place in the park even remotely busy, we decided to give it a go. And yes, it was absolutely worth it. The atmosphere, trees, and lush flowers were just so peaceful. By far the highlight of the park and something everyone needs to experience at some point is the Fern Canyon Trail. Both Fern Canyon and the aforementioned Tall Trees Grove require advanced permits to access, but they're super easy to get your hands on and are only used to control the influx of people visiting these places. Fern Canyon might be the most peaceful short hike I've ever been on. It's essentially made up of steep fern walls on either side and a little creek flowing through meaning you will get your feet wet. If you do this, make sure to bring some waterproof hiking boots and then you should be completely fine. Right nearby the Fern Canyon access road is Elk Meadow, which isn't much of a site on its own, but it is where a lot of elk like to hang out. These are some of my favorite animals ever. I think they're so beautiful and fit into the atmosphere of Redwood National Park perfectly. Last thing I'll mention is the coastline here was a huge surprise. We unfortunately didn't plan any hikes or activities around the waters of Redwood National Park, but we did sleep in our vehicle right outside park boundaries on a beautiful gray sand beach. Watching sunset and sunrise over the beach and seeing some wildflower bloom somehow coming out of the sand was amazing. Other than the things we experienced, there aren't exactly a ton of long hikes in this national park and certainly no back packing like Sequoia and Kings Canyon. Therefore, I'd imagine those parks would rank higher than Redwood if I'd experienced some longer trips there. But for the time being, Redwood National Park takes the first of my top three spots in the state of California. Number two, Death Valley National Park. I don't think there's another place in the world that can even come close to replicating the sights of Death Valley. I know people like to say that they feel like they're on another planet at some of these places, but I truly have felt this way during both visits I've had to this park. I first went here in May 2022 with my brother and we were so impressed, but going back in the winter made the experience even more amazing. Seeing snow-covered peaks looming over what is widely considered to be the hottest place on earth is insane. The highest recorded temperature in human history was recorded at Badwater Basin at 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Speaking of, Badwater Basin is the lowest point in North America, a true testament to California's natural diversity since Mount Whitney, the highest point in the lower 48 states, is just 80 miles away. With all these extremes, you wouldn't expect such a picturesque, colorful landscape, but that's exactly what you'll get here. Death Valley has one of my favorite top two attractions of any one national park, and that's Zabriskie Point and Dante's View. Zabriskie Point is a series of silky smooth golden badlands that absolutely blew me away on my latest visit. Something new I got to experience was the Badlands Loop Trail, where you actually got to hike into the Badlands and get unique perspectives with none of the crowds. Dante's View is an unbelievable overlook as well. 
It requires a bit of a detour to get to, but you'd be making a huge mistake skipping out on it. The view of the large expanse of salt on the valley floor looks almost fake, and is something that needs to be seen to be believed. What you're looking at from Dante's view is the aforementioned Badwater Basin, the lowest point in North America, and some of the finest salt flats in the country. Running around this white expanse was amazing, as the ground looks like it's covered in a layer of snow or something. Some underrated spots I also want to add in here are as follows. Devil's Golf Course is similar to Badwater Basin, but doesn't require any hiking, and is much more rugged in its own right. It was said that only the devil could golf on such harsh terrain, and it's no wonder why. Artist Drive is a super fun scenic route through some colorful eroded mountains. Everyone always mentions Artist Palette, which is worth a stop, but the entire drive is equally as good to be honest. Lastly, the Mesquite Flat Sand Dunes are one of the best places in California to see rolling sand hills. You can walk as far as you'd like to where the dunes look almost completely untouched, and you can also sandboard here as well. Death Valley National Park is an amazing place that doesn't look like it should exist. Of all the parks on this list, I think this one is the most otherworldly and unique for sure. But I do have one national park ranked higher, and hopefully it was obvious from the get-go. At the number one spot is Yosemite National Park. It's hard to argue that Yosemite isn't one of America's most spectacular natural wonders. Places like this are put on such a high pedestal to the point where you wonder whether or not it'll ultimately meet expectations. But Yosemite met and exceeded these expectations and is one of the few places in nature where I felt like time froze. Yosemite is home to the world's most amazing waterfalls and some of the most unbelievable granite cliffs you could possibly imagine. Sites like Tunnel View and Half Dome are just so amazing, I can't even put them into words. There's a special place in my heart for Yosemite because it is home to some of the longest hikes I've experienced so far. The mist trail we did was about 7.8 miles if I remember correctly and it is my favorite hike I've ever been on. The scenery and waterfalls on this trail will blow anyone away. Vernal Falls is unbelievable and seems hard to top, but Nevada Falls is the most incredible waterfall I have ever seen. Yosemite Falls is also outstanding, one of the top 10 tallest waterfalls in the world, standing 2,425 feet, and it is an icon of the park. Hiking to the very top of the upper Yosemite Falls hike was a strenuous 7.6 mile journey, but so incredibly rewarding. And to think that this doesn't even include any of the backcountry hiking. When you take those into the picture, I think you could argue that Yosemite is the best natural National Park in the country. Something I'll urge anyone visiting the park to experience is Hetch Hetchy. This part of the park gets so few visitors in comparison to Yosemite Valley because it is pretty remote. But the reservoir is absolutely beautiful, surrounded by dome-shaped mountains almost resembling fjords in places like Norway or New Zealand. The water is dammed by a 430-foot tall dam, and while its construction was controversial, there's no denying that it is a spectacular piece of architecture. The 4.6-mile out and back trail to Wapama Falls is absolutely one of my favorite hikes in any national park so far. The waterfall stands 1,080 feet tall, meaning it is almost twice as tall as Nevada Falls. The fact that I had never heard anyone talk about the Hetch Hetchy section of Yosemite absolutely blows my mind. It really just sealed the deal that this was one of my favorite national parks and places I'd experienced in the world so far. So if you could only visit one national park in the state of California, Yosemite is the one you should choose. But honestly, each and every one of these is beautiful in their own unique way. I'd strongly recommend spending some time at each and compiling your own list of national parks. I'd love to hear from you guys what your favorite national parks in the state are and how you'd rank them up in the comment section below. I spent loads of time working on this video, so please do me a favor in leaving a like on this video and subscribing to Travel Dash for more content like this in the future. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye, guys.